Okay, thank you. Um, I, I can just confirm, Chair, that we have all six commissioners online. If you'd like to do a, a roll call to confirm that everybody, all six commissioners can hear and respond, um, I'll pass to you, Chair. Yeah, thanks very much, Dave. And um, I'll just do a quick roll call of uh, commissioners, starting with the US. Uh, Chris, are you there? Here. Uh, Bob? I'm present. Present. Richard? I'm here. Thank you. Turning to the Canadian commissioners. Peter? Roger. And Neil? Yes, present. Okay, that's great. Everyone's here, um, can hear clearly. And Dave, we already heard from you. Um, do you have others with you? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I have a small Secretariat staff support of Keith Jernigan, Lara Erickson, and Ian Stewart, who will be able to uh, intervene um, as requested throughout the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Dave. And I see we have attendees of 53. Uh, I don't know if that's 53 additional or um, 53 including uh, the lines that we've already gone through, but nonetheless, we have 53 attendees. Um, their lines are muted. And so maybe I'll just go through the process and, um, and you can add to it as well, Dave, if I miss something. But basically <clears throat> we have in front of us a um, few proposals uh that we would like the commissioners uh, to consider for adoption at this meeting for a decision uh one is from the commercial sector for uh, a season extension uh, from the november 15th date to february 21st and the other is from the recreational sector who are seeking um, uh, an, a carryover of some underage from of up to 10 percent uh, to the 2021 season. Um, what the process will be is that, first off, we'll start with the commercial um, proposal, and then uh, we'll follow that with the recreational. Um, Dave will give a, 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 an overview of the uh, proposal that uh, for each one of those in order. <clears throat> we then as commissioners in Canada may add uh, to that uh, overview that Dave has for each one of the proposals and then um, we would uh, have people online that can submit uh, questions or, uh, or uh, if they want to add to what has been discussed uh, we could hear from those uh, Dave as my understanding is you that you would collect those those are all going to you you would read those out to us uh, commissioners and then we would respond or make some direction in case there was some other clarifications that are needed um, and then there would be a discussion among commissioners uh, of each one of the respective uh, two proposals that we're considering here today dave if i've missed anything or I characterize it incorrectly please and correct how this will unfold it's a bit of a new process um, and so it would be interesting and, and useful to get feedback <clears throat> from attendees online um, as well of, of uh, how that's working and how transparent that we are following through with these special session decisions so i'll stop there dave and turn it to you and see if i've missed anything Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, that, that's um, how we're going to help support the meeting. Um, and just a reminder that for, uh, as the Chair has just indicated, if there are stakeholders who would like to make comments or questions on the agenda item, it's under the questions tab um, in your webinar portal. Um, and then you just add your questions or comments to the agenda item. And we will ensure that they're presented and on, onto the screen for all attendees to view. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Chris, I'll just see if you had any um, comments about the agenda or the process. Uh, nothing additional, uh, Paul. I, Mr. Chairman, you, I think you got it down and we can proceed. 
All right, thanks, Chris. So, Dave, can you just give us a quick overview of the commercial um, that was submitted by the Canadian Commercial Fishery for 2B? Thank you, Chair. And so I'm going to draw upon both uh, support from um, Dr. Stewart and, and Ms. Erickson regarding a couple of the key components related to their expertise. So as the chair has just pointed out, this is referring to proposal A1, which is a proposed modification or amendment to section nine of the IPHC fishery, Pacific halibut fishery regulations related to commercial fishing periods. So the purpose of the proposal from Canada is to outline uh, considerations relating to a regulatory proposal from Canada to extend the 2020 directed commercial fishing period or fishing season is commonly known in IPHC regulatory area 2B from the current uh, established 15th of November 2020 to the 20th of February uh, 2021. Uh, and included in the proposal on the first page under the purpose is the specific text um, regarding the proposal from, uh, from Canada. And I am going to read this uh, in full uh, as it does provide the um, specific and direct context uh, from Canada. So in quotation, uh, DFO has received a request from the Halibut Advisory Board, industry advisor members, including commercial vessel owners, seafood processors, and union reps, in conjunction with the Pacific Halibut Management Association of British Columbia, Columbia have proposed to extend the Pacific region commercial Pacific halibut season to February 20, 2021 at uh, 2359 hours for the 2020 season only. They have made this request in order to increase market opportunities and alleviate the impacts caused by the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Attached is a copy of their request. And the request states, we will need to update quota management system with the modified commercial conditions of license for all ground fish HNL fisheries. Um, additionally, our quota officers will need to process a large volume of amendment requests in order to authorize folks to fish and land halibut past November 15th. So the more lead time they have for this, the better. There's also some outstanding thoughts on port sampling requirements. Uh, and perhaps compelling fishermen to land in one versus the other uh, post November 15. Finally, there is a need for fishermen to make business plans for their operation. And so this second paragraph is all about the operational need to make the decision intercessionally. Now we've outlined, the Secretariat has outlined in this summary paper, proposal A, uh, a number of key topics for consideration for the 2020 fishing period um, extension proposal. These include biological stock assessment, uh, fishery regulations, and also financial impacts uh, among others. And so we're going to just step through some of these general topics for consideration um, as you deliberate on these decisions. And so for the first two, in terms of the biological and stock assessment implications, I'm going to pass to Dr. Ian Stewart to give a very quick uh, summary of those um, elements for consideration. So Dr. Stewart, I'll pass to you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, and good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, the Secretariat staff considered two primary biological considerations with regard to this request. The first was whether this request would likely result in additional mortality, um, and the answer there is no, because of the use of TCEYs and the spawning potential ratio as the basis for our harvest control rules. Um, this, this request would not correspond to any additional mortality. The second consideration we made was with regard to timing of mortality relative to the spawning period. And as has been discussed in the past with, uh, with regard to consideration of year round seasons, the, we believe the Pacific halibut stock is being exploited at a rate where we are not relying on individual fish to, to spawn prior to their harvest. Uh, that is not, a, we do not think that's occurring in the Pacific halibut stock. And um, therefore, we, we find that there's um, no likely risk associated with biological considerations for extending the fish or fishing period either to the 31st of December or to the 20th of February 2021. Uh, I'll speak to the second um, component here as well, which is stock assessment and data availability. 
again, for the stock assessment, there are two um, considerations here. The first is just the process of projecting forward incomplete data series. And this is standard practice. We do this with many data series on an annual basis. Um, and although this corresponds to slightly more uncertainty as we move into the decision-making process, uh, this is generally not a problem, either procedurally or um, technically for the stock assessment. So a projection to December 31st is really in line with standard procedure that we use for um, other data sets. However, if uh, such a fishing period were to extend beyond December 31st into 2021, uh, these, this mortality would need to be considered as part of the 2021 mortality limits. And this is for several reasons. Uh, the first is that the stock assessment treats consistently the biology, the natural mortality, and the spawning period such that our reference points are always consistent with regard to being after a season's fishing and before the next season. That allows us comparability in our reference points across the time series. Um, if therefore we would need to account for any mortality that occurred after December 31st as part of the 2021 uh, mortality limit process. That's all I have on the uh, stock assessment of biology. I'll pass back to uh, Dr. Wilson. Um, thanks very much. Uh, four other topics of consideration include uh, the IPHC fishery regulations and also contracting party coordination. And in that regard, I'll pass to Ms. Erickson. Yes, thank you, Dr. Wilson. So to accommodate a change in management measures, um, the commission itself would take less than 24 hours, as we have dem demonstrated earlier, earlier this year. However, the relevant domestic contracting parties have indicated in the past that they need um, up to five weeks to publish their revised fishery regulations. And um, domestic legal advice would be required to determine whether the, these processes could be shortened or the time shortened for this, and um, particularly whether it could be extended into the 2021 fishing period, given these are 2020 mortality limits. Um, so we would, the IPHC would need to seek the advice of the contracting parties and um, particularly whether how the fishery may be impacted or the regulations may be impacted if the fishery is extended through to February and whether the fishery regulations are amended at the 97th session of the um, IPHC annual meeting in January 2021. And then in addition, as far as contracting party coordination, we do throughout the year and certainly leading up to the meeting cycle, the IPHC works closely with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, as well as NOAA Fisheries, and as well as um, United States of America state agency staff to coordinate the development and implementation of any changes to our annual fishery regulations. Um, so we would need to continue to do this um, given looking at extending the fishing period through the 20th of February, 2021. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, additional considerations are the uh, financial implications associated with um, extending the fishery to the, in, into February of 2021. Um, at the moment, we have it listed as increased cost Canada, meaning that there are just increased costs specific to the Canadian landing ports. Uh, and in this regard, we would need for year-round staffing to extend past the current November um, end of season through to the proposed February um, fishing period closure. This would allow for a IPHC port sampler or fisheries data specialist in the two landing ports or one landing port, depending on however uh, the commission would like to proceed to continue sampling of the directed commercial hal halibut landings uh, up until the closure of that extended period. Uh, it's, it would be anticipated that there would be additional uh, headquarters secretariat time associated with covering the coordination of the field staff uh, in, in those Canadian ports. Uh, we have included a, a rough estimate of what that may look like um, in terms of field staff salaries, the additional components, the salaries and benefits for the two ports, uh, Port Hardy and Prince Rupert, where we have uh, staff who are currently on contract and their contracts uh, end at the end of the current fishing period. Um, support staff for those two individuals and, and the associated expenses with that. And of course, miscellaneous supplies to continue to sample um, throughout that period. And so we have an approximation of 
$56,000 that would be required uh, to, to cover that uh, expense. So while we can certainly uh, accommodate the extension, there's certainly no uh, problem from the Secretariat's operational perspective. Uh, at the moment, that additional $56,000 isn't budgeted, and we would either need to um, make other reductions within the budget to cover those additional expenses um, or seek external funding, whether that's from Canada or, or another source. In terms of fishery and market effects, um, the Directed Commercial Fishery in IPAC Regulatory Area 2B is currently on track with, with past year's landings. Um, and this paper referred to the 31st of, of August landings. Um, regarding the most recent update for British Columbia, um, if we go to the IPAC website, if you haven't already used it, you can find the, the links to the three-year average. Um, and if you select British Columbia, for example, it gives an idea of where the fishery is this year, which is the thick green line. Uh, in, in relation to the percentage of fishery limit um, landed in previous years. And so you can see that it's uh, lower than the, the most recent uh, most recent three years um, commercial fishery landings. So these numbers are as of the 31st of August, but the latest numbers are available on the website, uh, as, as I just pointed out. And for the commercial fishery, um, it's uh, obviously higher than this current level. And I can bring that up on the screen um, once we have the, the general discussion of the proposal. There are other considerations that are, are certainly not within the realm of the current realm of the IPAC Secretariat's responsibility. And so we've made some general um, indicators of points that the commissioners may wish to consider, uh, such as the feasibility of winter fisheries, fish sales and processing capacity uh, within the winter months, um, and also the, the, the current influx of Pacific halibut um, from, from the Russian fleet, as well as the Atlantic, Atlantic halibut. Uh, fisheries. So we have some uh, additional points there, as I said, that are worth uh, commissioners considering, but the conclusion regarding those market aspects are that fishery and market effects of an extension of the current 2020 fishing period through to the 20th of February are, are, are not within our current realm and thus are, we're stating that it's unknown uh, for the Secretariat. Uh, however, they are likely to be specific to individual fishing operations and in this case uh, IPHC regulatory area 2b. In terms of an overall summary therefore um, the proposed uh, fishing period extension to the 20th of February 2020-21 there are no substantive biological reasons uh, to avoid an extension in the Secretariat's uh, opinion for the directed commercial fishery um, or for that matter for the US, USA fleet, um, other than the financial consequences that we've detailed in this paper. If contracting parties were able to commit to covering any additional sampling expenses as ad hoc payments, or as I mentioned, uh, for the Commission and the Secretariat to make uh, modifications to our current budget, then there would also be no financial impl implication, sorry, impact or obstacle for us to implement the proposed change. So with that, uh, Chair, um, we'd simply indicate that the Commission note this paper, Proposal A1, and uh, make the deliberations on how you would like to proceed with the proposal. And so I'll pass back to you, Chair. All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'll just see if there's any further um, comments from Canadian Commissioners uh, about the proposal before um, opening it up further. Hi, Paul. It's Peter. Yes, Peter. Yeah, so I just thought I'd give a little bit of brief uh, understanding of why this uh, proposal came forward, why this particular proposal came forward, and um, kind of the idea behind it. So uh, once COVID uh, hit, the minister uh, asked uh, if there was anything they could do to help uh, uh, keep business uh, going and afloat and all those kind of things and so a group of uh, buyers harvesters and the like uh, they looked at a lot of different ideas <clears throat> one thing that came out was we wanted to harvest the fish uh, this year 
Uh, we see it as a protein source for the country. Uh, we wanted to get it out of the water. Um, the issue was uh, that the market was very different. Uh, so we went from a service, uh, food service uh, that bought you know up to 70% of the product uh, to, uh, to retail, which uh, you know traditionally only bought around 30%. So the retail market only could handle uh, so much product at a time. Uh, there was higher demands for retail, uh, just through grocery stores and everything. People wanted to eat local. Uh, this kind of led to us having smaller trips as a whole. Uh, so in order for the buyers not to flood the market, they worked really well together. The industry worked very well together to Kind of dribble the fish in uh, through smaller trips to satisfy the um, the retail market <clears throat> and keep pricing relatively strong. So because of that, we kind of um, so we did look at other options and ideas, but this one suited us the most was just give us a bit more flexibility in terms of trying to get this fish out of the water. So we were having these discussions in March, um, April, and into May, and uh, we actually put this for proposal forward uh, May 20th uh, to the department. Um, so we are still behind um, traditionally where we are, roughly uh, six to eight percent, I believe, and. Um, we're concerned that uh, it's gonna be harder to do these smaller trips because of weather windows diminishing. Um, and we don't wanna flood the markets um, with, uh, with uh, large deliveries right at the end of the season. Um, in Canada, buyers generally do not do well when they freeze fish. Um, Another problem we're gonna that we are and we have is crew. Uh, there's still a good portion of fish left in the water right now that have to get out. And um, just to people are fearful about going back to work. Um, people are fearful of being on a workplace that it's hard to social distance. And so <clears throat> people are choosing. Many crew are choosing to take. Um, government uh, programs that were actually just announced in late August for fishermen and that subsequently are just kind of rolling out right now and people are finding it very difficult to find crew to uh, harvest these fish. So the idea behind this proposal was just about flexibility. Um, Nobody knows what the future will bring, and we just wanted the flexibility to harvest this, uh, you know, halibut as a protein source for Canada and ensure that it made the marketplace. So, yeah, if there's any other questions. And I'd like to add that just on a biological standpoint, if, if we had uh, thought that there was going to be, or if there was any uh, biological reason not to do this, we would have probably, we would have pursued a different uh, idea or option. Um, but as there is none, this is the option we chose. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, Dave, I just wondered, were there any comments at this point uh, or input from the attendees online? Yes, thanks, Chair. We, we do uh, have a number of comments uh, incoming. Um, I guess at this point it would be worthwhile just reminding uh, attendees, if you do have questions or comments, please put them into the questions or comments box that's shown in the webinar. Once you hit enter and, and it's sent to the Secretariat, the Secretariat will lift those comments and questions into an Excel spreadsheet. And so we can um display that in just a moment we're collating a couple of them chair so if there was any more discussion amongst commissioners before we referred to them that would uh, certainly assist us with coordination yeah okay thanks dave um just see if there's any other comments um, neil did you have anything you wanted to add at this point 
I don't think so, Paul. I think uh, Peter's summary was uh, helpful in terms of the background or rationale for how the department understood um, this proposal. Okay, thanks. Um, Chris, I turn over to you and to see if you wanted to ask any questions about the proposal or do you want to wait for um, Dave to collate the comments that are coming in and we'll deal with those first. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get too far into discussion before we hear those comments, but I, I, I do have a question and, a, and maybe a general comment. Um, back, Ian said that any harvest past December 30 first would count against 2021 mortality limits. So I'm trying to understand the math on that. For example, if you had a, uh, a season extension and a million, a half, let's just say, for example, half a million pounds were taken after December 31st, how would that get accounted for? Because if it came off of Canada's 2021 limit, it would be the same effect as foregoing it in 20. I, Maybe I'm confused about that math. Sure, Ian, if you'd like to respond through the chair, thank you. Thank you, through the chair, Commissioner. Um, this is, in fact, exactly the, the topic we're probably going to discuss on the, the second proposal as well, which is the question of how the yield is calculated with regard to carryover beyond the current calendar year. And so, as I mentioned, uh, we use December 31st as the cutoff for collating fishery mortality and also the biological processes in the calculation of the reference points. So in that regard, the yield that, we'll, that we will estimate for 2021 will be as of the end of the year, which means that um, anything that was not caught in 2020 will be included in those yield estimates. As uh, Commissioner Oliver noted, in order to accommodate this in the 2021 mortality limits, uh, any catch after the 31st of December would have to be accommodated somewhere in the TCEY calculations for uh, 2021 explicitly because that would be when the, the calculation of yield would be for the year 2021. Hmm. Okay, I, I, I think I got it. Uh, just to, Mr. Chairman, a, a general comment or two. Um, you know, we on the U.S. side looked at a I guess a similar uh, proposal earlier in the year that came uh, to the North Pacific Council, the extended season and a potential carryover, and for uh, as well as the adjusted charter management measures in uh, Area 2C and, and 3A. Uh, the council didn't take any action on the first two, uh, similar to the proposal we're talking about now, for for a number of reasons. Many of them were centered on the multiple Alaska regulatory and administrative processes that are linked to the current season closures. Um, but also, I, I think there was some discussion that this is, you know, an issue that deserves a, a time, more appropriately considered at an annual meeting where you have time and people have know what, what's coming and how to prepare for it, both from a business planning perspective and a management and regulatory perspective. Uh, I do re recognize COVID that puts us in a very unique situation, but um, for, for many of the same, I've heard a lot of concern. This came late, you know, pretty late in the year here, and I've heard already a number of concerns from U.S. fishermen and processors, which are sort of the flip side of many of the things Peter outlined for why you were seeking this extension, which is, you know, put there's not an interest in extending the season on the U.S. side. There's um, the concern of have there's not going to be processor taking fish after November 15th, from what I understand. So you would have a frozen in a market issue and competition potentially with a fresh fresh halibut on the market year round against a frozen inventory. I think those are some of the primary concerns I've heard. So I'm going to be pretty keenly interested in hearing what we the comments we get from the stakeholders. Uh, when I look at the graph, it's the catch rate and catch levels for 2B are slightly below previous years, uh, pretty much very, well, pretty slightly below on average and right in line with 2017. So when I look at that going into week 40 here, 
it, it does look to me like there's still the opportunity to, to catch your fish within the current season closure uh, or perhaps shortly thereafter. I'm, I'm having a little trouble with the need to go all the way to February um, when I look at that catch graph and, and coupled with concerns we have that I mentioned about the market. So I'll just stop there with those general comments and uh, put people on give people an idea of what's going through my mind and uh, as they provide us comments and I'm just uh, be happy to have the, the discussion after we hear those comments or any other commissioner's thoughts, of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, well, um, Peter may want to add to this. He did touch on it of the time frame of uh, the commercial proposal that was put together back in uh, May of this year, and it did go to our minister, which um, took some time to, to get a reply, but um, we did, and so it's now in front of us. And so I think, it, you know, whether it's now September or whether it's back in May, I, I don't think the overall premise has really changed of looking for a season extension to uh, in response to COVID. And this is um, in response to that, to deal with the too many challenges we've had across um, all regulatory areas of dealing with COVID for this year, as well as the, um, the set line survey that was undertaken this year as well, all had to deal with changes uh, in response to COVID. And I guess from my point of view, I see the commercial request as reasonable uh, way forward um, to provide some flexibility for the commercial sector to ensure that they get as much of the TAC as they wish. Um, I can't speak to why the North Pacific Fishery Management Council chose not to take any action on similar requests. Um, kind of leave that up to them to decide how they wish to proceed, but um, we see that there's no biological reason to uh, implement this um, or impeding moving ahead with implementing this. And um, I think we've proven that we've made timely decisions and um, don't think the timing of September is too late to make one now. I don't know if Peter or Neil wants to add, but and anything that I've added, but uh, that's kind of how I see it at this point. Yeah, Paul, I just say that the, you're correct. Like this is just about flexibility, and uh, I do understand the concerns about um, uh, competition. Uh, but as highlighted in the document, the competition already exists. Uh, we have a 12 month uh, year <clears throat> East Coast fishery that's delivering uh, fresh halibut. Uh, you have a uh, Russian inventory frozen um, that's in direct competition. Um, as well as there's now Norwegian farmed uh, halibut that is hitting our marketplace. So I do believe the competition already exists and I do believe that it's not going to be a great number. As you pointed out, we are not terribly far behind. There may be some upcoming challenges, we believe, that are going to, when, when usually people ramp up their fishing, it might not be able to happen. Uh, that's our concern. And so uh, in terms of 2017, that was an odd and peculiar year. There was a market correction within the system, uh, within the season, and there was uh, in our area 2B, we have issues around leasing, and there was uh, very much concern. So we were actually very much behind on that year too. Um, but uh, the, uh, that's Sorry, Peter, you got cut off there, I think, or stopped. Oh, sorry, yeah, no, I was done, sorry. Oh. All right, um, Dave, how's that spreadsheet coming along? Thanks, Chair, I can certainly bring it up. Uh, it's um, going to be a live document that we're populating, so as I project it, please do um, forgive the behind the scenes workings that you'll see. So far, we have uh, two fully credited um, questions that are coming through and a couple of others that are being formatted down here and so we'll, we'll get to those. 
Um, so, Chair, with your indulgence, uh, the first comment or question is coming from P Patricia Phillips. Um, and the question is, would mortality as a percentage of harvest rate increase or decrease? The current four-month non-fishing period ensures a positive degree of untouched biomass that improves in increased biomass. Uh, and Chair, with your indulgence, this is a, a question for uh, Dr. Stewart, so I'll pass to him to respond if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be good. Great. Go ahead, Ian. Thank you. Through the Chair, um, no, the, the answer is as long as we accurately accounted for all the mortality that actually occurs either in 2020, 2021 or both, uh, this would not result in a change in the harvest rate or the level of fishing intensity unless that was a decision explicitly made by the Commission as part of the 2021 uh, mortality limit setting process. Okay, thank you. Then the second question is from Linda, Linda Benkin, and the question and comment is, this has been a tough year for all fishermen with prices down by 40 to 60 percent. British Columbia catch is only slightly behind past years. The frozen market will be flooded this winter. Fresh fish on the market will significantly depress prices even further for frozen product. This proposal will lower the value of the Pacific halibut harvest for the majority, all US fishermen and any BC British Columbia fishermen who have filled their quota to provide relief to a small number of fishermen. Alpha does not support the proposal. Uh, so it's it's more a comment. Uh, thank you, Chair. Then we have uh, an additional question comment from uh, Chris Spora. As a result of COVID-19, Area 2B directed com commercial fishery landings have been and continue to be behind last year's numbers. A significant portion of the TAC remains to be harvested, and there is concern that the catches could fall even further behind last year. The amount of fish landed per fishing trip is down this year compared to 2019. It is taking more trips to get the Pacific halibut TAC out of the water. We are now entering the fall and the weather will worsen. There will be fewer and smaller windows of opportunity where vessels can safely fish. In addition, vessels are increasingly finding it difficult to retain crew as many crew members are concerned about COVID-19 and are choosing to remain home with their families rather than risk the work environment. Uh, and that's the three questions, comments that we currently have on, on this proposal, Chair. Um, and if you would like to uh, entertain additional questions or comments, um, I, again, I would encourage any attendees to put them into the, the question box and uh, the Secretariat will ensure that they're posted and pasted into this table for uh, addressing by the Commission. So over to you again, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for going through those. Um, very much uh, appreciated, Dave. Um, I only have maybe an overarching comment. I think it's been, and I think I said it earlier, I think it's been a very tough year for all um, harvesters of halibut, whether it be commercial and or recreational, um, in response to COVID. And so I think this proposal is trying to provide a, a bit of flexibility to um, commercial sector and uh, don't see that it has the impact that uh, for the amount of fish that will probably harvest in the coming months if it's agreed to. So Chris, I guess um, unless there's more comments, um, where would you like to go to next? Well, uh, let me just get an understanding where we are process-wise. Are, are we going to take up the other proposal and hear public comment on that as well before we move to take in any debate or de deliberation or action? Or are we going to dispense with this issue in its entirety and then go to the other one? Um, I was proposing the latter. Um, that is that we would deal with this proposal and then go to the next one. And so am I to then um, understand that there is no further public comment on this uh, this specific proposal that was it 
Uh, through the chair, yes, we have currently have only those three specific comments that have been entered in through the portal as per the agreed process. Um, if you were to move to, to close that, I, I would make the recommendation that you pause for five minutes to allow stakeholders to, to further consider and, and add additional comments or questions uh, before we, we, we move on um, as one possible suggestion, Chair. And Mr. Chairman, I, I would uh, like to do that and uh, maybe while, while we're, instead of just pausing for five minutes, we could have a, I had a maybe another question or two uh, and then we can see if anybody else, uh, you know, signs up for public comment while while we're, while I ask my question. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't know. If this may be to Peter, um, and I'm trying to really get a handle, Peter. We we've got two months left, two months left still in the current season, and you know. Um, Yes, we have the COVID situation, but I don't know that it's any worse now than it's been over the past several months when people have been out fishing at almost the same pace they have been when I look at the graph. Well, I'm just not seeing that that gap that gap that shows that people aren't able to fish. So I, how much is it that you over the next two months people think they won't simply won't be able to physically catch the fish because of various COVID related conditions versus uh, they'd rather catch the fish after November 15th than over the winter. And again, would, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I would say it's the uh, former. So people want to get the fish out of the water. Uh, the buyers have a desire to get the fish in the water. Um, we're just unsure. Uh, like I uh, said, there, we're having a bit of a crewing issue. The uh, crew is uh, um, in short supply in BC. There's not many people that want to uh, pursue this line of work, and particularly right now, and particularly when uh, there's certain packages that are coming out. Uh, it's somewhat incentivized. Uh, not going out for an end of the year uh, um, trip. So most most uh, uh, halibut boats they do um, at the end of the year they gather up crew from other fisheries and they go out and go uh, pursue uh, getting their allocation of the water um, for those that choose to do it in the fall. So the idea is there's a concern that um, they won't be able to do that. But I, I do think that there is a real, uh, it isn't that people are going to want to choose to fish in December or January or even late November. <clears throat> I just think it's a flexibility issue. And there's a bit of a, a concern that um, we are behind, uh, you know, not as much as um, some areas, but we are behind and we're concerned that we're going to fall farther behind. Um, that's not the hope, but uh, just a bit of flexibility in terms of um, uh, making sure that doesn't happen for us is what we're asking. Um, I don't know if I have a question. I mean, a comment, I guess. Um, I, you know, I've, I've, I've always kind of had the philosophy that we chat once we set our you know shares um uh, each party should be um have power over you know how and when they harvest and kill their their allocated halibut uh as long as it's uh harm neutral if you will or you know sort of no no harm to the other party and so you know and improve like like I would characterize the action we we took earlier this year with the charter uh, regulations in 3A and 2C appreciate that and you know similarly when we talk about the, the potential rollover in your other proposal but I you know I so far we've only had a couple of public comments but I've gotten a lot of input from stakeholder holders over the past few weeks directly that have expressed pretty significant concern with 
the market implications. And so I'm still having, when I look at the catch that statistics and I appreciate the need for flexibility, uh, I, I'm still concerned about that much open-ended flexibility given the, what I've heard to be fairly significant market concerns from our U.S. stakeholders. So uh, I'll pause there and see if other comments or maybe if there's any other public comment. Um, Paul, it's Neil here. Can I make a comment? Yeah, please go ahead, Neil. Um, I, I, I think, Chris, uh, I hear that um, concern and, and you can read it in Linda's comment as well. I guess I would I would just want to kind of test that a little bit. Um, I bet you that we could probably agree that not many fishermen are going to choose to fish in the months of December, January, February by choice, um, just given that conditions really do get pretty nasty to be out at that time of year. And so my my sense is that there's a pretty strong likelihood most of the catch will be out of the water by November 15th. And what we're really talking about is is kind of like the the final dregs. Um, and so I, I do, I guess I, I have a bit of skepticism about how what is likely to be a, to end up being a pretty small volume of fish really would impact um, you know, a, a market that uh, in either is kind of nationwide or even continent wide, um, particularly given these other sources of fresh competition that already exist. Um, and just wonder if, if we're, if we're um, more worried about the, the scope of impact on that than we really need to be. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, yeah, Bob. I don't know if anybody has re-signed up or we have any additional commenters. I was kind of holding some my my thoughts until we we had uh, exhausted the public. Um, could, could you have uh, David check that out? Sure, Dave. Did you have any more comments? Yeah, thank you, Chair. We do have a, have a couple of uh, additional. Um, the next one is from Peggy Parker, and the comment is as follows. <clears throat> we all agree that everyone has been hit hard by the pandemic and are facing similar marketing challenges. We further agree that the impacts on our market have been and will continue to be incredibly challenging. Those in favor of extending the season from November 15th, 2020 to February 20th, 2021, um, I'm not sure what the next word is. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic is the main, maybe that's site, the coronavirus pandemic as the main reason needed for the extension. Those opposed to the extension note that this proposal would give a competitive advantage in the market to only one regulatory area over the other seven regulatory areas. They also note that no one can yet gauge the full, full impact of this season extension will have on the market in terms of fusion in product identification and price or potential changes in product quality. And, and forgive me for um, stumbling through a few of the words there. It might have just been some typos. Uh, so that's the comment from Peggy Parker. There's uh, also a comment from Kathy Hansen. CEPA does not support this proposal. There is fairness issue between countries' marketplaces. The conference board always requests a longer season than is granted and told by the secretariat that they need to finish the season earlier. So how would this extended season work on providing the data gathering? And, and with your indulgence, Chair, I'm just going to correct to this statement, the secretariat, uh, does not tell anybody what they should be doing and we've specifically not put up proposals on season dates um, until requested by the Commission at the last meeting. So just a correction there. 
There is a, another comment from Stephen Rhodes, which states, SPC would like to state our opposition to extending uh, the Pacific halibut season. This will deflate the value of our frozen inventory. Every pounds of fish, fresh fish outcompetes the frozen inventory. And there's a comment from Jesse Kiplinger. Approving to extend 2B season gives a short-term market advantage to a limited group of harvest harvesters or harvested that could create some issues for Pacific halibut buyers in other parts of the IPHC jurisdiction. The decision will potentially come at a time when those other buyers are too late to amend their buying and processing plan. Uh, and that's all the comments and questions we have at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Dave. Um, so, Bob, I think those are the additional ones. Yeah. Um, so, I, I just wanted to add that um, over the last uh, couple of weeks, or when this, since this uh, information or request came to be generally publicly known, I've talked to representatives from um, Icicle and Pacific uh, Choice, uh, the Bessickers, Northport, um, Icicle, and um, they they express similar concerns with the um, competing with the fresh versus their frozen product. I I know that uh, a number of my boats, I think about ten days ago. We're rotating out of the Bering Sea and the Aleutian Islands, and they probably delivered about uh, altogether about six boats, probably a couple hundred thousand pounds to Westward Seafoods. And I'm pretty sure that had Westward known that they might have to compete against frozen fish, they may not have paid the price they did in in Dutch Harbor um, because that fish is generally going to go frozen out that out west. Um, so we are getting that that argument from our processors. I personally am in favor of an extended season. I, I like the idea of, of either uh, an earlier opening or extending on the, on the back end, recognizing that we may not have every processor participating because you need some volume to keep these plants open and, and that doesn't always come through in, in December. Uh, but I think that decision needs to be made at our annual meeting so that the buyers know up front what they're getting into when they're buying fish in uh, August and they have to freeze it. And um, I, I, I uh, acknowledge that uh, Peter's observation that we're already competing with some Russian uh, frozen and um, and some Eastern Canadian maritime um, fresh, but uh, there is uh, a bit of an offset with transportation costs at this point, not much, and frozen usually gets beat out by that uh, anything fresh. Um, so I guess I'm kind of, winding up with uh, concerns that Chris expressed and um, but I'm not entirely a no um, but it, you know because I, I, I'm looking at where you that green line this year goes and if you needed a week 10 days or something like that to finish it up uh, and then um, have a serious discussion next year about a, a more um, extended season that's that's kind of where i'm at uh, right at the moment uh, mr chair all right thanks bob um paul mr chairman uh chris if i could ask a, a process question for you or dave sure i just as as we're having um the discussion i I'm getting pinged with some some emails and text messages from different constituents that uh, uh, who say they have submitted um, letters. They submitted letters, presumably to the IPHC, uh, on comment letters on this. And not, apparently, a number of organizations. And uh, I don't know if 
where those letters are or you know whether you're Dave or of knowledge of those letters or are they somehow posted somewhere to the extent people all of these folks aren't necessarily online here commenting orally there have been apparently a number of letters submitted thanks uh, commissioner oliver and, and th through the chair uh, the short answer is no with the exception of one we have received uh, immediately prior to this meeting um, from uh, Peggy Parker. Uh, otherwise, no, we have not received any letters. Uh, so I would uh, just simply okay. uh, indicate that to any stakeholder that we have not received any other letters. And so if you would have sent one, please resend it. Uh, we can certainly provide that uh, as soon as we receive them. And if you have a particular comment to do try and put it in the comment box now. But just to, just to reaffirm, we have received one letter uh, at the start of this meeting. Um, from Peggy Parker, but no other letters. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. And, yeah, Mr. Chairman, Chris again, and I, I don't know how you want to proceed. I, we don't have a motion on the floor per se, but I, I did want to maybe respond to uh, some po on the point that Neil made, and that was, you know, that maybe we're a little bit over fearful because there's probably not that many people that are going to choose to fish in the winter. And it, so season extension could, to some degree, be a moot point. But on the other hand, I, we really don't know. And if we announce today that we're going to extend the season, it, it's possible, I'm not saying likely, but possible that everyone could choose to stop fishing for the next two months and save all their unused quota for January for, or December for, for perhaps, you know, legitimate market uh, reasons which would be detrimental potentially to the concerns that bob and rich and i have expressed so i'm not saying that's likely but it is possible but that's the other part is if if, if we really think it's likely we're going to harvest most of the fish by november 15th and that we're really talking about that last trickle of fish that we don't want to lose um then maybe a much shorter season extension might be something that I, I could get my head around uh, or find myself be able to support. Uh, you know, if someone were to say, it, it, some, I, I'm assuming some of these fishermen have already caught all their quota. Some of them may be 10% away from their quota. Some of them maybe are saving it up till the end. I don't know, but if we had some, a proposal rather than a blanket season extension all the way to mid-February, we said something like a person could catch 10% of their IFQ uh, af between November 15th and December 15th, and that would an, an additional month would be a total of three months from today for people to catch their fish. I might be able to, I might be able to support something like that. So I have said that without there being a motion on the floor. So apologize if I'm out of order. Paul, could I respond? Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, <laughs> I, I honestly don't believe uh, just because of uh, what kind of marginal values we're talking in terms of market. I don't expect the, there to be a big surge in prices or something. Um, but um, I, I would find it very difficult to believe that people would be able to get crew in January or December to run out there to do a quick halibut trip. Uh, myself, we've already fished our allocation. Generally, um, how it works in British Columbia is we have, uh, we're maxed out at a block and most people choose to do their block all in one lump sum. So that would be a matter of two, three trips. Um, and that's how the, the fishery generally proceeds. So that's why there's a concern this fall that uh, when guys go to get their lump, um, they might not have the crew or the capability. And, and I appreciate it. what we're asking for here is not, uh, I mean, the date uh, just aligns with the end of our season for uh, ground fish. That's why the date was chosen. But any sort of flexibility uh, that, that allows uh, us to alleviate that concern to, uh, you know, that last, 
worrying about that last weather storm and keeping crew together um, because there is a there is a serious uh, fear of being on these boats where you can't socially distance. I've experienced it on my crew. Um, I know many people that uh, have experienced it and their boats are actually tied to the wharf because they just can't even find crew for other various fisheries. So, um, like I said, this is about flexibility, any flexibility that's available, um, we're, we're, we'd be happy to consider. See, Chris, it's uh, Paul here. Um, appreciate your offer of uh, maybe supporting something much reduced from the actual request. I think um, the way you were casting it, though, would be not possible for us to really deal with within our ITQ system. And um, so maybe something simpler uh, rather than uh, all the way to February, maybe uh, a month extension uh, would provide enough room to try this uh, out to provide some flexibility for some fishermen that have, for whatever reason, not been able to fish, still provide some additional opportunity um, and takes into account some of your concerns, I, I think, about competition from uh, fresh and frozen. It probably, Paul, this is Chris, if you're looking for a response, I, um, and I can't speak for Bob and Richard, I certainly want to hear what they have to say. The, um, the whole idea of the extension with two months left still and does give me pause given the market concerns that, that I've heard, but, but to answer your question and speaking for myself, if, if we um, are talking about given that extra month, which would then be through December 15th, which would now be three months from now, uh, to give folks that flexibility that Peter described there, uh, I, 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 I could support that, Paul, and I'm speaking for one U.S. commissioner. So um, I guess make that a formal motion, and then so I... But I guess it back to you, uh, Richard and Bob. Um, whether you would support what I was proposing as a reduction in time, just add a, an additional month to December 15th. Paul, oh, this is Richard, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you now, Richard. Oh, yeah. So I just like to comment, I guess the the comments I've been getting from stakeholders kind of align with the comments you heard before. And I think the major concern was uh, market competition between having fish halibut on the market. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting a grasp as to how much of impact that would be. I mean, uh, I guess I'm he hearing from Peter that this would be a small amount of halibut and it might not impact the price prices much, um, but I have no way to judge that. But um, so I think in the long run, going all the way to February, there's a lot of issues uh, as well as the extended marketing window. Uh, but I'm inclined to, like Chris, uh, if it was a shorter extension, like a month extension, that. I think that's uh, you know reasonable to see exactly what happens. It gives that flexibility to Canada uh, and addresses some other concerns. But that's my comments. Thanks, Richard. Bob. Yeah. Uh, could we, uh, Dave, could we get David to put up how much fish is left in two B right now? I, yeah, I thought it was like a million five, but I can't remember commercially. You there, Dave? Yeah, sorry. We're just trying to bring it up on the screen. Uh, what's currently it's not allowing us to, to zoom in at the moment. 
So for regulatory area 2B, the commercial fishery, um, it has taken 74% as of the 15th of September. Uh, and that's the most up-to-date figure we, we have at this point in time. So I, that, that looks like about a million three left. It sounds about correct, yes. Yeah. Quick maths. I'm just... Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I could go uh, two weeks, but I, I'm just reluctant to, to go much, much further, Paul. But uh, you know, my other two commissioners, uh, I think uh, I, it, this is really tough because I, I, I we got processors that uh, are shutting down. Um, not sure if they're going to reopen next year. Um, this this is uh, difficult for me uh, to to extend it beyond uh, just a couple weeks, uh, Paul. So that's where I'm kind of at, I think. Paul, it's Chris. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't know um, if um, if you have any thoughts on that. I think if we start talking, whether two or three weeks might be a, that provide enough that flexibility you were looking for. I think we're, we're starting to split hairs a little bit when we get down to that, but and it becomes more about the, you know the principle maybe as much as anything. I do think um, when I look at the numbers and 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 if you believe that people are in fact going to go if which I kind of tend to believe people are going to choose to try to catch their fish before the weather gets too snotty and that uh, we're probably talking about a, a, a pretty small amount of fish that are going to be harvested after November 15th that and and given that you know while i i i i am concerned about the market issues that have been raised um i'm i'm just i'm, I'm a little like bob you know i i'm not entirely comfortable with extending it a month but 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 i i i could go there uh but is two would two or three weeks make a difference to to you all would would that be something that would still help get where you want to be and get all the U.S. commissioners in a little more of a comfort zone. So I try to, if it's a minimal impact we're talking about, you know, I want to try to be as accommodated as we can, you know, to our neighbors in the north. Um, well, north of where uh, part of us and south of the others, but you know what I mean. And so um, I don't know if two or three weeks is enough. Uh, thoughts on that? I, I'm trying to see if we can get somewhere that we could all support. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I I'll let Peter speak to whether two or three weeks are worth it. I I the reason I said a month is I thought that that would provide enough time to really make people make plans. Um, I suspect that administratively, two to three weeks is going to well, two is going to be a challenge for us um, to really deal with. And so at least that's the feedback I'm getting here, just with some messages online, I guess, Chris. To, answer about the two weeks um so i you know i i do respect the concerns that have been raised about uh the potential impact but i guess i stress the word potential and given that there's already market fresh on it i just having a hard time seeing it but i'm no expert in that area so um peter i guess i turned over to you about what Chris proposed of two to three weeks, whether that is worth it or not. I wish I knew. Uh, <laughs> as I said, this is about flexibility and not knowing. Uh, you know, I I assume that closer it got to Christmas, there probably isn't a big market for halibut is at that time anyway. But um, I don't see people pushing to harvest their fish then. Um, but 
you know, this is all about flexibility and, and uh, um, I'm not, sh I, can, I, I wish I could answer that as, a, as, as best as I can. I think that uh, some people are confident that we'll even get the fish out by November 15th. However, others are not so confident. So, um, you know, it just, it's that, uh, and, and I would like to emphasize that the, the push is to get the fish out of the water. I don't, I don't think we're talking a large amount. I don't think this is a, uh, like I say, this plan came about in May when there was a lot more uncertainty. And um, so there wasn't any strategic planning to, you know, harvest your fish sometime way late. Uh, you know, most most of what's been happening is business as usual, is, but just smaller trips and uh, trying to deal with a different marketplace. So, um <laughs> That's what I got to say on that. All right, thanks, Peter. Um, so, Chair, I, I understand that Hannah has typed some more uh, comments in. Maybe David could bring us up to speed on that. Sure. Yes, thank you very much, Chair, through the Chair. Uh, a comment, another comment from Linda Banken. Uh, I do not support an expanded season. Everyone made decisions based on the published season, fishermen and uh, I assume processes. From Lyle Pierce, as a 2B fisherman that has already put their quota in our group, supports the idea of a one year extended season. We are not talking about a lot of effort or fish being landed. And with the threat of COVID rearing its head again, markets are unstable and it is proving more difficult to crew the vessels. This will give fishermen the flexibility to get their fish to market without having to take unnecessary risks. Our vessel did a IPHC winter Pacific halibut charter. The month of December was pretty much a write-off for catching halibut as the females are so full of egg that there was no room for bait food, sorry, bait food and they would not bite. That is one of the reasons that Canada is asking for the February 20th um, season date. From Peggy Parker, my letter is on behalf of Hannah, not myself. I will add a section that is in my letter that the commissioners may find helpful, and that is about the process. It follows uh, in quotations. Hannah cautions against the process of changing current management measures in season when impacts are coast-wide and have not been communicated to all stakeholders earlier in the year. If a decision is made at this special session, the commissioners will be bypassing the time-honored process of engaging with all stakeholders. The conference board and the process advisory board, as well as other advisory bodies, such as the scientific review board and the research so that should be the research advisory board on this issue. There are equity marketing issues for each regulatory area that is not given this extension. There may also be equity issues with Canadian fishermen who plan their year thinking the season is closing in November and thus cannot take advantage of the extension. Earlier this year, the IPAC convened a special session for the commissioners to consider changes that impacted only the sports charter fleets in 2C and 3A, which were triggered by trip cancellations caused by the virus. There were zero impacts beyond that sector and those two regulatory areas. We urge you to not consider proposal that have coast-wide impacts at special session meetings, but continue to allow all stakeholders to discuss, study, and decide together what their advice advise will be at the annual meeting. Thank you. Uh, and then another comment from Angus Grout. We are currently experiencing a significant uptick in COVID cases in British Columbia as we approach cold and flu season there is a significant chance of another shutdown any added flexibility would be greatly appreciated and that's all the comments we have at the moment thank you chair all right thanks dave um so um chris i think we need to bring this to a close if you agree i'd like to make a motion that we 
um, extend the season for one month in Canada in Area 2B. Um, I have got feedback that two to three weeks is not worth it. And so hence uh, proposing that the season be extended for one month. Um, and uh, look for the US support to that proposal. Paul, I'll second the motion for discussion. Um, because I did have another question and a possible amendment. Okay. Um, we talked earlier, and, and I, maybe I'm splitting hairs now. I um, talked earlier about maybe a limit of, say, a person could catch up to 10% of their annual IFQ bet between November 15th and December 15th. Can you help me understand why that would be necessarily problematic if we were to impose such a cap? And I, I don't even know what the effect would be, frankly, uh, other than somebody that held more than 10% of their quota still unfished would obviously have to catch part of that before the end of before November 15th. Uh, can I take a stab at that, Paul? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So we're very different than, uh, say, Elastic Alaskan ITQs. We are not owner operator. Uh, the quota just flows like a river all over the place, and so um, generally, there's not that many people that own quota that actually fish. Uh, it, greater than half so we're very much different than uh, how Alaska is set up so uh, that that quota has already been all leased and is on different vessels and uh, it would be very I don't even know if it's possible to track to be honest yeah um, the Paul, it's Neil. yeah go ahead Neil. Uh, well just on Peter's last point there um, there would be a unfortunately a, a challenge on the department's part <clears throat> to be able to um to as peter said be able to track that I, we don't we don't actually have the administrative capacity to set up and then um administer or um oversee that kind of uh sort of specification given all the complications that um peter was describing Great, thanks, Neil, for that explanation. So, I don't know if you got all that, Chris, but that that's the issue, really. I just don't see that we have that ability to track it. Yeah, yeah, no, I I understand that. I understand that. Um, I think I get it. So I I'm still experiencing a little discomfort. Um, I would like to try to. Uh, offer an amendment to your motion, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And that would be to extend the season, not through December 15th, but through December 7th. I believe that it, well, if I have a second, I'll explain. I'll speak to it. Am, am I permitted to second? Or does that need um, to be? As far as I know, you are, Bob. Okay, I'll second it. Yeah, I think that, and again, I, 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 I hesitate to try to split hairs, but I'm still trying to balance the discomfort I'm hearing from stakeholders. It seems to versus versus the uh, desire to grant the flexibility, some some flexibility that you're seeking, and recognizing, you know, some of the things that were were pointed out that it's likely that it's not going to be a huge amount of fish it's likely that uh it's going to be that last trickle of fish but it's you know given that we have two months still between now and november 15th uh it seems another three weeks uh should be ample time um you know it's, i know it's not the best weather of the year when you're getting to that time of year but a three week period people know now that they have that extra three weeks so it's uh two months and three weeks from now 
I think it should give people that that three weeks to me is that is a seems like a, a reasonable balance of of balancing the market concerns against balancing the flexibility to get that last trick, make sure people have the opportunity to get that last trickle of fish. And so that that's basically my proposal, uh, my amendment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a question, Mr. Richard. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm not clear on the Canadian. Ahead, uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question on the Canadian side. Like, if the quota is unfished, I mean, the U.S. side, we can roll over some unfished quota to next season. What is the policy there if you don't you don't fish all your quota? <laughs> Do you want to explain that, Neil? Um, Richard, it is similar in Canada in that um, there is a provision that allows for individual harvesters to carry over uh, a certain amount of uncaught quota. Um, uh, so, so that is in place for 2B as well. I, I think Peter would probably be better placed to speak to, you know, what this proposal would add to that um provision in terms of providing flexibility yeah so the so the rollover um of 10 percent you're allowed 10 percent uh, maximum uh, is um that's by an individual by vessel and so like i was explaining how our fishery works most people do their whole block at one time um you might space it out over a number of weeks or a month or a couple of months but they generally try to do all their halibut in one chunk and so um most vessels they've already you know got within that threshold that they're they're comfortable with it's the remaining vessels we're talking about so and they would individually uh only be able to carry over 10% of the quota that uh, they would be allocated. So on a block, that's 1% of the TAC is 5,000 pounds. So there's, that does add flexibility, but um, this is just to add a little bit more security and flexibility. So um, I understand the concerns and that, and this is a kind of a new one and it's out there and uh, I would support the December 7th. I think that uh, that just that gives us enough flexibility. I personally don't know of many boats that um, would choose to fish that that much closer to Christmas anyway. Uh, so, I, and I don't even really uh, view anyone that was going to try to catch it. Then it's just that flexibility that folks need to, uh, so they're not going to do something that's unsafe or um, ill thought. Well, um, I, I, I've always been envious of uh, Canada's parliamentary procedure to get things in and done quicker than I, uh, south of the border here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, just a comment. Thanks, Kyle. I um so uh on the motion uh I guess Peter I'd ask if how do you feel about is it worth the uh what the the motion is that's on the table right now? I feel that uh that does give added flexibility. Uh obviously it alleviates some of the concerns uh from folks south and north of us uh in terms of uh, market competition um really don't believe i believe it is going to be a small amount of fish uh, that will be harvested after the closing but it is hard to tell um but i would be supportive of the december 7th i think that that would give us enough time um that that, that gives us a bit more flexibility thank you all right. Um, 
Neil? Um, well, I mean, really, uh, if Peter is supportive and thinks there's some benefit, then I am also supportive. Okay, thank you. Um, so for myself, uh, similar to Neil, if um, the extension to December the 7th has some benefit, uh, we will try it out and see what impact that may or may not have both on um, the ability to harvest uh, 2B's TCEY, but also whether there's any impact um, and concern for uh, has been laid out here in this discussion. Um, so Chris uh, and I guess Dave, uh, we'd move ahead with the season extension to, well, actually I should have confirmed before I say all that, uh, Chris, I should check with the US. Richard, do you support that? Um, I'm, not, I'm having like Bob a uh, hard time doing the extension just because of the process, but understanding this COVID is so <clears throat> huge an issue, um, I, I guess I'll support it to the seventh. Um, this is Bob. Go Bob. ahead, Bob. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Bob. I'm supportive of, of the December 7th. The motion I, I, I uh, seconded. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the discussion and questions and concerns that have been raised about the proposal. Um, and uh, I think unless there's anything else on that, we can move on to the next one. Dave, you. Hey, Paul. Yep. Sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't clear. Did. Um... You didn't do an actual vote. I, I I had trouble hearing Richard. Was he in support or not in support of the amended motion of December seventh? I'll let Richard speak for himself. Yeah, with some reluctance, I am in support of it. Okay. Thank you. And uh, just Paul, I I'll reiterate. Obviously, I made the motion. I support it. Thank you. Um, Good discussion. Uh, and so with that, Dave, we'll move ahead with the December 7th extension for 2B. Great. Thank you very much, Chair. And so just, just for the, the meeting record, it will state that the Commission has adopted by consensus uh, revising the fishing period closure, closure date for the 2020 directed commercial fishery in IPHC regulatory area of the 7th of December 2020. And so in terms of the suggested regulatory text or language in Appendix A, the am amendment here would be uh, 7th December, 2020. Uh, and with that, Chair, uh, we, as you have pointed out, we can close this item and move on to Proposal A2. So thank you, Chair. Um, as indicated, Proposal A2 is a proposed amendment from Canada to amend Section 28 of the IPHC Pacific Halibut Fishery Regulations relating to recreational or sport fishing for Pacific halibut. The purpose of the proposal is to outline considerations relating to a future 2020 2021 regulatory proposal from Canada to allow 10% of the Canadian uh, IPAC regulatory area to be recreational fishery limit if uncaught to be added to the recreational fishery limit in 2020-2021. Uh, and specifically the proposal from Canada reads as follows. Recreational Pacific halibut fishery changes in response to COVID-19 for area 2B. Recreational fisheries for Pacific halibut have experienced disruptions to fishing opportunities and markets and are proposing sector-specific management responses for consideration by DFO and the International Pacific Halibut Commission. The recreational fishery is seeking an underage carryover provision that would allow 10% of this year's recreational TAC, if uncaught, to be added to the recreational TAC in 2021. Uh, again, we've provided a number of topics for consideration. 
um, the regulatory components and the consultation components are the same as we've heard for proposal A1, so we're not going to read those. Uh, but for the biological and stock assessment considerations, we've combined them into one section. And again, with your indulgence, I'm going to pass to uh, Dr. Ian Stewart, who will highlight uh, some of those considerations for you. So over to you, Dr. Stewart. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, um, each year the stock assessment uh, uses the actual mortality estimates from the most recent year's fishing and not the, the mortality limits. Uh, this is necessary and important in order to provide the best estimates of the biological processes and also to provide consistency in the reference points. And so what this means is that yield that um, goes uncaught in each year is already accounted for in the stock assessment when, when each year's results are, are presented. We go through a process of reconciling uh, between what was projected for mortality and what the actual mortality was. And again, the actual mortality is what's used in the stock assessment. Uh, therefore, when we produce the 2021 stock assessment, the estimates of yield and TCEY will already have, will already include um, any fish that were not captured, even if they were expected to, during the 2020 fishing season. Now, the, the increase in yield in the upcoming stock assessment will not correspond exactly to a one-to-one -one, um, translation of the foregone yield from the year before, and this is due to the processes of natural mortality movement among IPHC regulatory areas, as well as updates to the stock assessment itself. It's even possible under, uh, under some conditions where we could see a decrease in yield, even where we didn't catch as many fish as we expected the year before. So what this means is that in order to stay consistent with the process as we have, have we, we've done it in the past, and as well with the biology, there are two options for addressing um, a potential carryover or rollover um, in 2B recreational catch for 21. The first would be to allow this change to play through the domestic catch agreement. Therefore, whatever um, catch limit was set for regulatory area 2B in 2021 could accommodate this rollover as part of their catch agreement. Um, this is, of course, a, a domestic party um, choice. The second would be for the commission to make an explicit increase in the overall mortality, either at the coastwide level or at the um, IPHC regulatory level associated with the 2021 limits in order to accommodate such a carryover. So those are the, the considerations from the perspective of uh, the stock assessment and management process. Um, just to follow on then, Chair, the, as I mentioned, the IPAC regulation uh, and consultation components remain the same as Proposal A1, and therefore, as Dr. Stewart has, has pointed out, that uh, in summary, uh, any fishing yield not harvested in 2020 will be included in 2021 stock assessment projections, regardless of a carryover, uh, and then he summarized those other components. Uh, and so, Chair, we're simply asking you to note Proposal A2 um, and... Uh, continue with discussion. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Dave and uh, Ian for that. Um, Chris, maybe I just add a, <clears throat> some more um, background to the proposal. This was um, provided by the Sport Fishing Advisory Board to the department and the Sport Fishing Advisory Board. It's been a long time um, advisory process within Canada. You know, the Sport Fishing Advisory Board is made up of recreational anglers and lodge and charter sector uh, are members as well. Um, they provide us and uh, provide the department advice on how to structure the fishery across all species, uh, including halibut, and have um, provided us as a department with very good uh, information and advice about what their needs and desires and wants are of how they would like to see fisheries um, structured uh, to meet uh, what recreational anglers but also lodges and charter sector are trying to accomplish. Similar to um, within uh, Alaska and this came up in our discussion back in May around the impacts of COVID-19 um, uh, where we made some adjustments uh, in response to requests from the U.S. Um, 
due to the lack of international and regional travel restrictions opposed as a result of COVID, these restrictions have certainly put a huge um, reduction in effort um, by recreational anglers, but and has also been very um, harmful to lodge and charter sector within Canada and I'm sure within Southeast Alaska and elsewhere. So many where operations were forced to close for the 2020 season um, just could not open or if they opened it really was not worth it because the clientele was not there. Um, so uh, as a result of all that, um, <clears throat> the recreational catch uh, within area 2B is currently estimated to be about 34% of the um, recreational uh, share and it's not projected to be more than 49% by the end of the season. Um, so this re represents uh, roughly 450,000 pounds of foregone yield from negotiated uh, catch limits uh, will be foregone by the recreational sector this year. Um, so similar to um, what we heard from Peter and, the, uh, and also from Chris Spohr around the commercial sector, the um, SFAB um, convened and tried to brainstorm some ideas about what would provide some stability for 2021 in response to COVID. Um, and so their view was that we could do a better chance of maintaining a, a stable management regime for their fishery, the recreational fishery in 2021. And what would help that in their view would be to have um, an added measure of certainty and stability by adding uh, a carryover of some uh, uncaught fish in 2020. Um, so I think, I mean, that's basically sums it up. I would say that um, I will see if either Peter or Neil want to add anything, but I think the uh, Sport Fishing Advisory Board put the uh, proposal to the minister and um, she agreed that would like the IPHC to consider this and uh, wants to do anything that can do to help the recreational sector, whether it be the general angler or the lodge and charter sector to have a, a better outcome in 2021. So I don't know, Neil or Peter, whether you want to add anything to my comments? So I, th I think it's in the proposal, but this is just for this particular year and it's strictly due to COVID. So this would be a one-time um, consideration. Um, that's my understanding. I just wanted to reiterate that. Yeah, thanks, Peter. That's correct. Paul, um, Paul I don't have anything to add at this point. You did a good job summarizing. Thanks, Neil. Um, Bob, you sounds like you had a comment or a question. Yeah, a question. Um, uh, I think I saw that the uh, your your sport fishery here has eight hundred eighty thousand pounds. Correct. And, and you're less than fifty percent. I think is that what we saw. Um, yeah. Currently, we're estimated to be around thirty four percent of their allocation. Um, and so when we do projections to the end of the season, we're still going to be well under. And the current projection is that we'll be more than 49% under <clears throat> uh, by the end of the season, Bob. So the carryover would be 88,000 pounds? Uh, correct. It would be um, 80. Yeah, that's right. But maybe a bit less than that, but in that ballpark, 88,000. So a question back to Ian. I don't understand the double counting if they're leaving 40% of their quota in the water. If they catch 50% of it and um, transfer 10% of it to the next year, I, I'm, I didn't quite understand how that's double counting. Or did I totally miss your point? Thank you, Commissioner. Through the chair, I could answer that. Yeah, please go ahead, Ian. Okay, the, the issue is that when we conduct the stock assessment, we will use the actual mortality through the end of the year. So those additional fish that were uncaught during 2020 
will be accounted for in the stock assessment. So the yields in 2021 will be estimated to be larger potentially as a function of those fish that were not caught in the BC recreational fishery. Uh, we commonly have sectors in uh, a variety of different areas that don't catch 100% of their um, projected mortality. And any savings that occurs is always moved into the stock assessment and therefore occurs in the upcoming year's TCEY. So th those additional fish available for harvest will be there when we create the uh, mortality projections for 2021. They just have not been specifically assigned to a particular sector or area. And then one last question, uh, Paul, uh, maybe it's to Neil actually. Uh, do you have slot limits like we do in Alaska or do you have just a regular bag limit, one bag limit? Any size? Uh, we don't have, yeah, that's a good question, Bob. We, we do have bag limits. Uh, um, we have, we have daily and possession limits so how many you can catch in a day and then how much you can have how many you can have in your possession um, and then there is also a maximum uh, size limit but we don't have a slot limit i.e we don't have um, you know uh, uh, a particular size range that you can catch Did that uh, address your question, Bob? Uh, yes. I should yes. add, we also have, uh, we also have uh, uh, an annual limit. Paul, this is Richard. <clears throat> Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, so my understanding is that, you know, the rollover, uh, in Ian's explanation, the rollover of unfished allocation is distributed you know the next season to all the sectors uh, and so not it doesn't specifically go back to the sports sector in that proportion so everybody benefits by any sector leaving fish in the water uh, so my question is if there's so you know what's your forecast for next year as far as the ability for the sports sector to harvest their full allocation, no matter what that is. Uh, so in terms of Alaska, what we did was we we didn't ask for any additional allocation. We just wanted a more relaxed harvest measure so that uh, less number of anglers, but each catching a larger fish would get to uh, maximizing our allocation. So in next year's Scenario. Do you feel that there's still going to be this overhanging COVID, uh, you know, uh, issue with uh, tourism and people coming to Canada? And so, even given this additional allocation, uh, is, how is that going to help your marketing versus just applying a larger opportunity? So, increasing your size limits. Uh, making that more attractive to attract anglers. So in, in other words, looking at the quality of the fish versus the quantity of, quantity of fish you got to catch. Paul, could I offer some thoughts on that? Yeah, please go ahead, Neil. Um, I think those are great uh, questions, probably questions that are on a lot of people's minds. Um, so I mean, I guess the first part of the answer is probably that we don't really know any more than anyone else about what next year will look like. Um, it is it is definitely very uncertain. Um, what I can say is that we go through a fairly painstaking process, as it sounds like you do on the Alaskan side as well, to um, define management measures for the entirety of the recreational sector um, uh, which differs somewhat than the process in Alaska where you know you you distinguish between charter slash guide and the um, kind of the the broader public angler sector uh, but in any case we we, we go through a, a process where we define management measures that um, to the best of our ability to forecast are intended to align with the um, size of the allocation available in that year. 
And so for 2020, um, you know, we went through that process pre-COVID and defined a, a number of restrictions, maximum size limits, annual limits, daily and possession limits um, that we thought would keep the catch within the allocation. We, um, we would probably approach 2021 um, uh, quite differently if we had an inkling come January, February next year that uh, COVID was still going to be a potential um, influence on the, the number of anglers or the amount of fishing effort, the number of visitors, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, if the allocation looks different with or without carryover, uh, it would influence how liberal those uh, management measures are. Can I just interrupt for a sec? Um, there's a lot of background noise. Um, if people could put their phones on mute unless they're speaking. Sorry, Neil, they interrupted you. Did you have more? I think I might be the source of the background noise. I'm trying to keep <laughs> a five-year-old entertained 15 <laughs> feet behind me. Um, so uh, I don't think there's too much more to add, um, at, at least maybe not at this point. OK, thanks, Neil. Well, I have a follow-up. Yeah, go ahead. So getting back to Ian's, um, there's, there's two options that the allocation, if it was rolled over, has to come out from somewhere. Uh, either has to come out from, you know, a catch sharing plan uh, between, you know, in your case, the recreational and the commercial fisheries, or has to come out from the coast wide. Uh, what is your thoughts on that? So Ian, I don't know if you heard that, but I think the question is directed towards Ian if he had an answer. So that was actually uh, directed for, towards the Canadian commissioners. And in other words, Ian's discussion said that the fish, if it was rolled over, would have to come from somewhere and would have to either come from a capturing plan, and in this case, uh, commercial fishery in Canada would have to uh, move some allocation over to the recreational fisheries for that rollover, or would have to come out from the coast wide, in which would involve the whole coast wide, <clears throat> you know, TCEY. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, did, fish aren't, it has to come from somewhere, I guess, in Ian's explanation. Um, Paul, it's Neil. I could offer a couple thoughts there. Yeah, and I had one too, but go ahead. Um, so I, I don't think we're contemplating changes to our domestic allocation policies um, for reasons that probably anyone listening can understand. Um, and with respect to you know how we handle this, I guess my observation is we have a number of um, pretty significant sources of uncertainty or uh, noise in the system when it comes to um, what we set as our estimated total mortality versus what ends up getting incurred. We have um, a commercial carryover arrangement that exists on both sides of the border. Um, uh, and I, it would be helpful, I think, to understand a little more on how we manage that um, example of a carryover in the context of building it into our planning for the subsequent year from an IPHC perspective. Uh, and I guess, you know, the amount of fish we're talking about here is significantly less, I think, than some of the other sources of uncertainty in what, what our total mortality ends up being. And so that's probably part of what will inform um, 
at least my perspective on what we might be willing to contemplate for a one-year arrangement that accommodates some very unusual circumstances. Um, I mean, obviously, that's couched within an interest in being as precise as we possibly can be and continually improving on managing every source of mortality to a specified amount. But um, I guess those are some of the kind of ba counterbalancing considerations that go through. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, a question, Neil, this is Bob. Um, has Canada liberalized any of their, um, um, what I want to say, uh, um, bag limit on halibut this uh, summer uh, to try to get uh, more uh, activity? And is this uh, catch driven by tourism? Uh, both good questions, Bob. Um, so we did uh, make a change uh, in mid-August uh, where um, the uh, daily limit was um, changed from one to two. <clears throat> um, in terms of, of where the, like what makes up the, um, the catch, um, the, you know, there's, there's certainly a significant charter guide lodge component to the fishing effort for halibut. I don't know that we have ever really pinned down how much of the total catch that makes up. Um, but, you know, I think anecdotally, it's this year may be indicating how important that section of the total catch is to the recreational catch. Um, for, because so many lodges and guides have either seen, you know, very large reductions in their business or have not opened. And one area in particular, Haida Gwaii, uh, which is a major source of halibut recreational catch in BC, um, has been closed for almost the entirety of the year due to uh, local outbreaks of COVID. Uh, and so uh, the lodges there, with the exception of a few who opened for a very short period, have been closed for the whole season. Um, maybe the one other thing I should mention, which I think folks are aware of, but we also did introduce an overage recovery policy um, for the recreational fishery where if the sector exceeds its allocation because of our uh, because of the imprecision in, in managing it to a specific number, uh, we've implemented a policy where that would be recovered out of the subsequent year's allocation to that sector as a means of um, ensuring that year over year we are balancing out their catch with their allocation. Thanks, Neil. Um, so, Bob, I think that addresses your question. I, um, I think the other point that Neil was talking about is, yes, we did make some changes in season, but the basic answer is our toolbox is rather limited in Canada to make adjustments. And so we did what we could, um, and that provided some um, uh, assistance, but uh, clearly not enough. And uh, given the travel restrictions, both domestically and internationally, and as Neil outlined, uh, many of these lodges never opened. Um, certainly many of the places but I typically see where people go to go fishing for halibut on the west coast or even on the north coast of Vancouver Island, um, where in many years you would have to have a long-standing reservation before you could even move your uh, boat and RV there if that's what you wanted to do. Um, there were lots of vacancies. Um, people were just not there. And uh, as a result, uh, the catch is down currently. Um, 34 and probably be in the neighborhood of 50 by the time uh, we close out the season. Mm, Paul, Chris here. Yeah. A couple of questions. A um, couple of math questions, I guess. Follow up on Rich's question. I mean, I as I said earlier, I'm all for maximum discretion for each party, U.S. Canada, to catch and 
managed halibut uh, maximum flexibility for how they catch and how they manage their fish, as long as it's harm neutral to the other party. I'm, I'm still a little confused about the math. I think I understand Ian's point. It, uncaught fish will go back into the assessment modeling exercise and to some degree increase the overall uh, amount available for everybody the next year. And I, I don't know what, I don't think it's one to one, of course, but at some point that fish has to come, whatever the amount of poundage is, and that's my second math question, whatever that <laughs> amount is, it's going to either come off the top and everybody's going to pay us a, a small tax to support it, or it somehow would come off of Canada's, whatever we decide Canada's number is next year. So I'm still a little confused on that. And even though it may be a small amount, I'm, my confusion causes concern. Um, but that leads to my second math question is how many pounds are we actually talking about being potentially rolled over? Because I, as I read the proposal, it's 10% of any uncaught tax. If the tax 880,000, and I think you said you project cash roughly half of it, you're talking 10% of 440,000, which would be a maximum potential rollover of about 44,000 pounds. Am I, is that correct? Um, I understood it to be 10% uh, of the tack that would be carried forward or roughly um, 88,000 pounds. Yeah, because it says of the tack, if uncaught, to be added to the recreational tack, because otherwise you could come one pound short of the tack and roll over 88,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, now, if you're talking 10% of the uncaught amount, then that makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's. I, yeah, otherwise, uh, I wouldn't I want to see a Go ahead. I'm not not uh, sure. If I could try to clarify, it's Neil here. Uh, my understanding is. So if there is an uncaught portion of the TAC, the proposal is to roll it over, but up to only 10% of what the total TAC is. So if, if, like you said, Chris, there were actually, you know, 30 pounds left, uh, the proposal would allow for 30 pounds to be rolled over. But if there were 440,000 pounds left, the proposal would only allow for 88 or 89,000 pounds, whatever the exact number is, to be rolled over because that's 10% of what the total allocation was. Paul, this is Richard. Yeah, Richard. Yes, yeah, so I have another it's a process question. Uh, whether mm -hmm. this action needs to be done here at this meeting, or could it be taken up at the annual meeting? Because this these reg this rollover and regulation doesn't really uh, need to be done in the 2020 season, right? It's the 2021 season, correct? Yeah, that's the intent. So we could um, table this into the interim meeting and annual meeting? Um, that is a possibility. Um, just before going there, I see that Dave just identified that there are some comments online. And maybe we could go to those and Dave could read those out and we'll come back to your question then, uh, Richard. Sure, bye. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we currently have four uh, comments and questions. The first from Peggy Parker. Why is action on this proposal included in this special session when it could be included in proposals for the annual meeting in 2021? Uh, and I think you're having that discussion right at the moment. Um, another question from Douglas uh, Doggett. Uh, would any fish taken after December 2020 be taken off the Canadian TAC 
or strictly from the commercial TAC. If the uncaught fish would be double counted and inconsistent with the process, why does this not apply to individual vessel quotas in the commercial fishery? The third question and comment is from Chuck Ashcroft and it states, it would be helpful if the commission could advise how 2B commercial carryover of an underage provision is treated. It is double counting. Is it double counting? Is it problematic for assessment? Our proposal is designed to mirror that of the commercial carryover potential. Uh, and then a final from Robert Hawkness. I have concerns with the proposal to carry 10% of the recreational Pacific halibut allocation. I recognize COVID has caused hardships for many recreational fishing businesses in IPHC area 2B. Nevertheless, this cannot be used to justify adopting measures that increase uncertainty and risk to the resource. Recreational halibut Catch estimates are incomplete and uncertain due to the limitations of recreational catch monitoring and reporting programs. The in-season management approach is limited in its ability to produce timely estimates of recreational halibut mortalities, and there is uncertainty in forecasting catch. For these reasons, a precautionary must be taken to the management of the recreational halibut fishery. Carryover provisions should not be considered until we are confident that we have precise and accurate estimates of the recreational Pacific halibut catch in 2B. While the pound, poundage under consideration may seem insignificant, particularly if considered on a coastwide basis or impact on the biomass, using such arguments is a slippery slope on which we do not want to find ourselves. At some point, the insig insignificant add up and become significant. Uh, we have another one that's just come in from Chuck Ashcroft. It would be extremely helpful if this proposal is decided upon regarding commis commissioners early. Otherwise, the recreational sector will have, well, it's a little bit difficult to read. Otherwise, then the recreational sector will have, I'm just gonna read it verbatim. Otherwise, then the recreational sector will have be in a difficult situation as our decisions have to be made the weekend after the annual meeting in order for conditions of license to be developed. Additionally, all of our discussions for potential management options would be on hold until we understand whether a rollover of 10% will be allowed this year. If we know that we will have this capability, then planning can take place once the interim meeting has been conducted. Thanks, Chuck. Um, over to you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so, Richard, back to you. You had a question. I must admit I've forgotten what it is right now. Did we address it or is it still hanging? Well, I guess that posed a question of whether any action uh, needed to be done at this special meeting or could it be held uh, at the interim and annual meeting since the the rollover and uh, wouldn't occur into 2021 season? Um, well, I think we heard part of the answer to that in what Dave just read off from Chuck. And um, I do think um, there are some questions about how um, carryovers are treated and what the impacts are uh, in regards to um, allocations going forward. And I guess a suggestion that I have uh, right now, Chris, is that maybe what we need is a little bit more information that could be brought forward at the interim meeting um, because there seems to be a little bit of lack of clarity. Uh, maybe it's only on my part, but it certainly seems to be on others as well based upon some of the comments that we need a better understanding of what's being done right now and what those impacts are for carryovers uh, for unused proportions. And so, I think um, basically from a process point of view, it might take some time to get that done before we can address it. I don't think we can do that at this meeting. And I would, I guess, recommend Chris that we have this brought forward and on the agenda at the interim meeting. I think waiting till the annual meeting will cause a challenge uh, for us and won't meet the needs of what we were trying to accomplish to provide some um, increased, um, 
ability uh, and flexibility for the recreational sector in 2B. Yeah, Paul, this is Chris. Um, I, yeah, I am having, you know, given the situation we're in and coming into winter, it's hard for me to imagine that there would be a huge negative impact in terms of business planning or booking uh, or recreational fishing operations if, if this decision wasn't made until the annual meeting. Um, that's in January, so there's if they knew in January that, and it looks to me like based on my my understanding now of the math that it's highly likely we're talking about 88,000 pounds. And so that's a little more, you know, Neil characterized it as noise and I, I agree with them in concept, but uh, yeah, it's almost 100,000 pounds of noise. And um, I'm a little concerned about the accounting aspects of that. I, I would still prefer that you know, this be a subject for the annual meeting. Uh, you know, maybe we can get some of these questions clarified uh, between now and the interim meeting. I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I see the big the planning downside of waiting till the annual meeting, um, but I'm, I'm certainly not comfortable taking action on this today. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that, Chris. And I think there are some questions there that need to be addressed. But I do know for the recreational sector in a typical year, they would be needing to make business plans as far as how they see things unfolding um, sooner than the annual meeting would be their preference, I'm sure. Um, and so I do think we need to have a discussion about this at the interim meeting and see if we can make a decision. I think rather than you know being hard and fast about this right now i think we need to put some questions to um, the uh, secretariat about how carryovers are treated and what some options are to deal with that because right now it seems to me that we do have carry forwards in fisheries um, this is identical to uh, what's currently in place right now so I'm a little puzzled by some of the concern being raised. Um, and as Neil and others have pointed out, this is much less than some of the other carryovers that are already occurring. And uh, it is for 2021 um, is, the, is what is being requested. So I think the agenda for uh, the annual meeting is pretty full. I think we need to do some work at least at the interim meeting. And if we can hopefully make a decision there, that would be Canada's preference. Paul, I'm certainly willing to uh, put it on the interim meeting agenda and, and see if we can if we can get there. So I'm per perfectly willing to take that path forward. Okay, thanks, Chris. Paul, well, before we break, can I ask one quick question of Dr. Stewart? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just in terms of when they have an overage position, does that mean uh, the fish are not double counted in that position? Uh, I'm just trying to think in my head there. I guess they're counted as the total mortality, um, but who pays the cost of that? Maybe I'm... Thank you. This is Ian uh, through the chair. I can answer that. Go ahead, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so they are, overages would, would not be double counted in the sense that they are also taken into account in the upcoming stock assessment. So overages from any sector come out of the available yield that's um, calculated for the upcoming year. R remembering that the survey information that we get reflects the distribution of those fish. And that's the other important component is that any overage or underage is subject to potential redistribution by the biological stock dynamics in the in the rest of the intervening year but any overages are accounted for and so to the effect or to the extent that one or more sectors goes over in a particular year all yield that's available in the upcoming year is is inherently reduced yeah so, so that's not specific to one particular area it's 
once it goes into the stock assessment, it's reduced over the whole for everybody, right? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay. Thanks, uh, Ian, for that explanation. So, um, Chris, where to from here? It'll be on the uh, interim meeting agenda. Um, I think back to you, Dave, there's been a number of questions to provide some clarity about how um, underages and are, that are carried over are currently handled and impacts of those. Um, that we would like some further clarity from the Secretariat so that we could <clears throat> have a more discussion at the interim meeting and potentially leading to a, a decision at the interim meeting. Thanks very much, Chair. And, and so in, in doing that, this would become a um, draft regulatory proposal and the Secretariat could uh, again develop the implementation notes that we do for each regulatory proposal, which would include those additional elements that you've just uh, highlighted um, as requests from, from the Commission. So we can certainly um, include that as the expanded implementation note for the interim meeting. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Dave. Um, the only thing I would add to that, I think, you know, post this meeting, um, Chris, with, at least within Canada, that we will have a bit of a debrief and see if there are other questions that we would like to bring forward uh, on this particular uh, issue. Um, and you as well may, and so I think it would be good if we had a opportunity to submit our, commission, our questions to the Commission and, uh, uh, excuse me, to the Secretariat and they can address them for the interim meeting. Yeah, totally agree, Paul. Yes. All right. Um, Dave, I'm not sure if any more comments uh, came in while we were speaking, and if there are, it'd be useful to hear them before we adjourn. Uh, no, Chair, that's all of the comments that have been received. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, so, uh, thanks very much for um, the discussion this afternoon, um, and uh, we will carry forward with the um, with the uh, at the interim meeting. And uh, Dave will probably be in touch with you and uh, via uh, sharing them with uh, with the U.S. As at the same time, some additional questions we may have about uh, needs to be addressed, so we can resolve how to move forward, uh, hopefully, with uh, a carryover of any uncaught allocation for the recreational sector. All right, thank you, Chair. So, Chris, unless there's anything else, I think we would adjourn. So moved. Sorry. Sorry, I couldn't get my button off there. I do not. I do not have anything else. I don't know if someone else was trying to get um, get the floor, but I don't have anything else, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Bob, you had something. Yeah, I said I just seconding your suggestion to adjourn. Okay. All right. I'm not hearing any opposition, so I think we're done. Thanks, everyone, for your time, and we'll chat some more. Thank you. Thank you.